Okay, so good morning. Okay, today we'll keep, is this working? Well, it doesn't seem, maybe, is it better? Okay, uh, so I'll be talking about, more about statistical modeling. This is too much. Uh, and I wanted to bring m m basically two examples, one example uh, using a GLM and one example using a mixed model. And there are obviously tons of possibilities, but this is more conceptual so you can understand the idea of both uh, models and model structures. And then you can open a book about mixed models or the, any type of model you are interested and be more comfortable uh, with those ideas. So, so we'll be talking about GLM, GLMM, and I wanted to talk about model selection, but I thought that it was too much for, the, for this class. So the tutorial, we'll be using the ideas of model selection. And that, again, is just like a really brief introduction on the theme. So this is a roadmap of like statistical possibilities. This is from uh, Ben Boker's book, Ecological Data and uh, Models, Ecological Modeling and Data. Uh, we are. Yesterday, we talked about linear regression. We can think about linear regression and ANOVA and analysis of covariance and multiple linear regression, all of this as general linear models. Everything here can be done with LM in R. Like it's basically a linear regression with like different uh, structure, different model structure. And here we call all of these general linear models. And if we have like no normal er errors or non-linearity, we can use generalized linear models. And here we have logistic regression, binomial regression, log linear models. Uh, this is for when we don't uh, match the assumption of uh, errors having a normal distribution. And sometimes uh, we need I will go through only like the paths that you will be seeing today. Um, our model is not enough to model uh, because of the sampling design or the experimental design. And sometimes we do need to model variance. That means adding random effects. And this is what we do when we are doing generalized linear mixed models. And those can be like uh, generalized or purely like linear model with uh, random effects, and this would be a LMM. Okay, those mixed models here, like we can have mixed models that are only linear models or mixed models that are generalized linear models. So this is basically, I mean, in, in Ben Boker's book, he says like, this is all that we can do with statistics. Obviously, this is not <laughs> all we can do with statistics, but with those tools, we can do a lot, and we can answer a lot of different questions and create hypotheses and translate hypotheses into models. So this is really a super powerful way of uh, answering a particular question. So when we're talking about, when we talked yesterday about linear models, there are assumptions that we need to fit so we can like build a linear model. Basically, we have to have a linear relationship between x and y. Vari variances uh, should be equal across all the predicted, predicted values of the response. Uh, errors should be normally distributed and independent. In generalized linear models, we can model the error structure. That's basically what we are doing. And we go into that when we don't fit the assumption that uh, the error is normal. And we do that by uh, creating uh, 
an expression, a formula for the linear mean, and we use a, li a link function. And when we do that, we are basically converting our generalized linear model into a linear model, and we do this with a link function. We'll go through that. So the link will the link function links your mean function to the scale of the observed data because our observed data is not normal anymore. So we will basically transform the data to a normal, uh, to have a normal error, and we do that using the link function. So I'm using today this notation. It's more common on stats book. So this is B, beta zero is our intercept, beta one is our slope, okay? So when we are, uh, the, the idea here is that we have a link function that will make the link between our data and the observation. And when we are like our predictor value will be the inverse of the link function. If we apply the inverse of the link function, we go back to having uh, the data in the same scale as we observated. Let's see how this works. So I'm bringing in again the example from yesterday. Uh, this is the uh, caterpillar data and we are just reading it and building a model here. We built that yesterday. We have, we are using a linear model of growth with respect to tannin from our DF data frame. We are estimating the intercept and the slope here. This is the notation of our linear model. So far, it's everything that we already did. When we are building a generalized linear model, we have to specify which family is the, like which distribution our data is following and which function we will be doing, we will be using to link our uh, a linear model to our response variable. And they are like defaults for that, I will show you that, but in the case of the linear regression, it's like the generalized linear model using a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution with link identity, meaning that it's exactly the same uh, mean uh, it will give us the exact same result, okay? Our intercept is 11, our slope is 1.2. It's the exact same thing as here. It's exactly the same thing because we are using a Gaussian distribution here. But we can use, like, it, not any other distribution, but there are, like, a few distributions that are available on the GLM function. You can find out uh, using the help of the function. And let's see how this is working. So the default link function for the normal distribution is the identity. So for the mean value, we would have like beta zero plus beta one X, okay? And in this case, the, uh, we are assuming the errors for following a normal distribution. If we translate this into a generalized linear model uh, notation, what we have here is that our y will follow a normal distribution because we are using a mean function to make that possible. In the case of the Gaussian distribution with the identity link function, it is basically the same as here, okay? So here, the error, the, we're assuming a Gaussian error structure and identity link. This is exactly the same thing as doing this, okay? Let's see how this is working for the Poisson distribution, for instance. So here we have our example, like Gaussian uh, family with link identity. Our uh, variable,
Okay, okay, we are back. Uh, so let's see how this goes for the Poisson distribution. We are assuming that uh, our response variable follows a Poisson distribution, okay? But we need to normalize that back. And the link function that does that is the log of the lambda. This is the, the lambda is the parameter of the Poisson distribution. And it's basically like log of lambda, lambda will be beta plus beta one x. And if we want to know like the lambda, the observation, like the value, the predicted value of an observation assuming a Poisson regression, what we do is the inverse of that, the exponential of beta zero plus beta one x. Uh, Sarah, can you explain better like what is x for example? Because mu is a numerical value. Ah, okay. And the x here? Yeah, it's a, a statistical distribution. Is the predict no, it's this is the predictor variable. Okay. Any value like of the those are the parameters that we are estimating. X here, if we have a regression, basic we regression, we have an x and we have an y. We want to find like the predicted values for a particular data. We want to build this line. We, we, we will still fit like straight lines. We, we still want to do this. We, we will use the exact same uh, notation here. And for a particular value of x, how do I calculate my y? I do that uh, assuming a Poisson distribution and uh, like any, like our mean value will be the exponential like the, the estimated uh, y value basically would be the exponential of our estimated coefficient beta zero plus beta one plus x, imagine that this is like 10, whatever. Okay, so for uh, the Gaussian case, mu is the prediction. Mi is the prediction. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, this is the structure of how we build uh, a generalized linear model. We need a mean function and a link function. And oh, our mean function, like in case of the Gaussian is this one, our mean function in, in, uh, when we are doing a Poisson regression, for instance, is this one, okay? This is how we will calculate each predicted value. We will see that in the code, I think it will get clearly, but the idea here is that uh, we still fit straight lines, we, still, we are still doing this, and in the case of the Poisson regression, we are, uh, we are making that linear by the log uh, transformation of the observations. And we want to re rebuild that, we use the inverse, the exponential function. Uh, so a little bit about the Poisson distribution. So we've used that when we have a discrete variable that is defined like on the range from zero to infinite, but this is discrete. This can never be like negative. And Poisson distribution has only one parameter, the lambda, and it represents both the mean and the variance. And this is just to show you that when we increase the mean, we increase the variance as well. And when we increase the variance, we already follow in the, in the situation where the errors of like a Poisson model, for instance, if we are, we are using a linear model, uh, would not uh, follow the principle of the like constant variance. So the, the variance is not constant per definition. So we need a linear, a generalized linear model here. Uh, yes. Mm, I see that we have different links uh, for each uh, distribution. Uh, how we can uh, obtain, like, the for every um, distribution, know what is the link? If, ah, uh, if okay. there is a theoretical way? Yes, or yes, yes, there are theoretical definitions for okay. the link, for the possibilities. There are limitations as well. So there is the, like, recommended statistic default for that. For Poisson is, uh, is the log. Uh, for other distributions, there will be other defaults and other, other possibilities. 
as well, but it's a limited pool for for each. Like it will depend on this, on the distribution. You can uh, deal with other options, but like it's not like you can build like any link because you have to make sure that your variable is uh, linear again and following like and and, and having an, an error distribution that is normal. Okay. So, but there are defaults for that. I will show you like there's a slide with that information. But first, let's build a Poisson regression. And here is the example of two bird species, cuckoo and warblers. And cuckoos, they uh, invade like the nests of other species and they make like the parents feed them. And this is a data set where uh, they are measuring uh, nesting mass of chicken grams and how it affects like how each species like bags for, for food. And they know that those are two species, those are different and the response for both species should be different, but they wanted to understand how does nestling mass, mass affect bagging rates between the different species? So we are reading the data. This is from a tutorial from uh, a guy called Valetta. This, uh, he created like a, in, an entire statistical modeling workshop. There's the link for that. And it's really, really great material. Only like recently I found out that, but I really, really like the way he described, uh, de defines things and, and his examples. So I'm, uh, I'm stealing, not stealing, because I'm acknowledging that it is from, from him, but uh, it's a really a good tutorial uh, as well, a good way to start studying. Uh, so here we have like three columns. We have the mass, we have in grams, the bag in bagging calls per six seconds. Uh, and we have like species here is a character. We have two species. And here is the data. So we want to understand how the max, mass affect, affect bagging calls. Uh, and how this is different in the two species that we have, the cuckoo and the warbler. There's a question, online question. What is the difference between feeding a GLM instead of just transforming the variables before the analysis so they follow a normal distribution and then running a standard linear model? Uh, essentially, uh, it wouldn't... Uh, make a difference in terms of uh, the inference. It's uh, sometimes, uh, I, I really think it's better like to have the data in, in its original form if we have the tools for it, for it obviously. Um, and then like building a generalized linear model, like correcting for that in the modeling process, then correcting that before, because sometimes there are things that you don't see, but es essentially it's the same thing. It would be the same thing. We should have the same response. The thing that like we, we could do that, actually the authors, this is a paper from 99, published like really well on nature or something and they actually like transform the data and feed a linear regression. And that's actually why he chooses this example to show how we could do that another way. But it's basically the same. It depends on how purist you are, basically. Uh, okay, so we are fitting here. I wanted to bring this notation as well. Uh, because we did yesterday a super simple model, like one continuous var variable uh, and another response continuous variable. Here, uh, we are fitting a model with an interaction term. This means that, let me, I want to explain this graphically, like it, using like the linear regression example. So we have here the mass and the bags. Uh, if we assume that both species respond equally, what we have is this. 
the same curve for both species. If we assume that the species, like, they present a similar response, so similar response in terms of the slope of the curve, but they would be different, uh, different, I don't know, maybe Cuckoo would be like uh, more bags than, oh, this is Cuckoo, and this is the Warbler. This is what we expect, and, and if we want to model this, what we would do is uh, mass plus species in our linear model. But here, like they are assuming they want to test, what they want to test is that like not only like the slopes are different, but also the intercept. So the difference here would be something, I don't know, this is must, mu much more steeper than the other one, like something like this. And this is what we want to re re represent. When we want this, we do uh, this mass and species because we are assuming there's an interaction between mass and species in a way that different species will respond differently to the effect of mass. Okay, this is the idea of the interaction. So that's why we are building uh, a model with an interaction term. We will, this is actually the same, I, I'm, we will test which model is better in the met model selection exercise. We will do that and see if this is actually the best model that we could fit to this data. But let's go back to uh, Natalia Kumavoto. Professor. Hi. Uh, so if we put this uh, sign of two species, but the two species respond equal, so it would be one line? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, if, if the species respond equal in you, you are putting this, you are basically overfitting, you're using like more parameters than you actually need to. Uh, one approach could be like testing. If you do not know that, you, you could compare those two models and see which one has the best fit to the data and that could like help deciding. Because sometimes we do we do not do not know that like yep. this is actually what we want to test, and yep. this stands for like when we are doing this we are simplifying we are simplifying the notation. So what is we are doing is basically mass plus species plus the effect of mass interacting with species interacting as the column sign, uh, but. We never have like only an interactive effect without the additive, a additive effect. So that's why like this is uh, simply uh, short for this and we will like you always see this notation rather than this one. But sometimes like you can build models with just the interaction term if you have like a particular reason for that. Uh, in my, my PhD, I studied a lot, like mixed models, and I wanted to build like crazy structures to test my hypothesis, and I built like in purely interactive effects with variables that I wasn't using this way, but this is because I had like a particular reason for doing that. In general, we can use just this. Okay. Uh, I gotta be confused with the relationship between bagging and mass. Shouldn't, like, the more you bag, the bigger your mess? Oh. Shouldn't it be a positive yes, relationship? Yes, yes, for sure. I'm building this in contrary. So this is this, this is this, whatever. Yeah, correct. Uh, okay, so let's, it's that one, okay. So this is our model here. And we will, start, we will start fitting a linear model, okay? We know that this is not correct, but we fit the model. And when we inspect the model, I want to show especially this graphic here. The other one. So we see here like the red line is like going up. And we do see like a pattern here, like a lot of values like here. 
So we have a pattern in, in this plot. So this shows us that the resi residuals do not follow a normal distribution. Uh, we do not like want to like continue. If, if, if I do this in real life, I would see this graphic and I'm, oh, I need to go back and I need to do something. What we will do now is that we will fit a Poisson GLM. So we are using the family Poisson with a log link. That's the only difference. The rest is the same. So this is now a generalized linear model. Every time we do that, we have to specify the family. If we do not do this, this is basically an, an LM, like the default. And we are using a Poisson function um, with uh, Poisson distribution with a link function. So how is, is this model working? Okay, I will show this because this is really important sometimes. Like we can do a graph like on ggplot and not understand what is going on, but I really want you, you to follow this. So this is like our mean function. And our mean function in the case of the Poisson uh, GLM is the log of lambda. And we have an intercept beta zero. We have uh, a different intercept for different species, as we saw here. Uh, okay, so the first one is the nesting mass. We are not in the, the other intercept. Here is the other intercept, like M is the mass and S is the species. This is a dummy variable, like zero or one. So our intercept our slope and our, our mass value, our uh, other intercept with like for a particular species and the other effect of mass uh, interacting with species. Uh, here we can assume like what the model will assume, not we but like <laughs> what is happening here, like one species, Cuco in this case, is the species zero, like the default. So when we are feeding a regression, the slope will be like the slope of the cuckoo because the S here is, is zero, those terms will not exist. And for the warbler is one, okay? That is what happening, is what ha is happening when we are uh, using a categorical variable in our model. So, uh, we have this general notation here for how the model is working, how we can estimate like predicted values for cuckoo, log of lambda being beta zero plus beta one M one, because those terms are zero. Okay, this is how we estimate the value for cuckoo. If we fi find this value, it won't be in the same scale as our response variable. To have that, we need to invert this as like assuming that lambda or our mean function is the exponential of this equation. And for the warbler, we just, we will keep like all the terms because S now is one. And what happens here is that we just do like simple algebra here just to show that this first term is the intercept and the second term, B1 plus B3, is our uh, slope. So this is how we can find the slope and intercept for the different species when we are feeding a model like this, like uh, with an interaction term, where uh, our categorical variable is a dummy variable zero or one, okay? So when we ex inspect this, I wanted to show you because this is what is happening here. Like we have an intercept, we have the mass. So this is beta zero, this is beta one. For uh, Cuckoo here, beta zero is 1.5, uh, beta one is uh, 0.05. And for the warbler here, we will we need, we need two values to calculate the slope and then the other two to calculate the intercept. So uh, our slope now will be the, our intercept, sorry. Our intercept will be 1.5 plus the species here, like the beta three here. And 
our uh, slope will be the mass plus the effect, the interaction of mass and species warbler, okay? Uh, and with that, we can like build uh, a line that will describe uh, our model. Uh, here, I'm comparing like this first plot is the residuals versus fitted from our LM and the second one from our GLM. This is better, this is much better, Ooh. but like, it's not perfect, but at least like this is not like going up and we do not have this uh, pattern going down here. This is more like spread and this is much better. This is how we should uh, proceed in this case. So uh, we could create uh, a regression line for a model, like doing the calculation that I just show, showed you. But uh, in R, as we saw yesterday, uh, there's this function predict that will predict a particular uh, response variable based on our uh, predictor variables. And that's what we are doing here. And we can provide to the predict function a data frame with all the observations that we want to uh, actually fit. Uh, I just have a question on the comparison that you made between the, yeah, the two graphics. The scale in the vertical axis, is it the, like the same? Yes, no, it's not. Okay. And that's a great point because if we see this graphic in the same scale, this would be basically a straight line, right? So this is much, much different than this one. Thanks for uh, noting, noticing it. Uh, but sir, don't we need to take in account that uh, in the graph, in, in the right, we took the logarithm, so the values will be smaller? Yes, but, but exactly. That's why we have that graphic that is looking good, okay? We, we did that. We used the log so we can li linearize the relationship between the two variables. And because we did that, like we have our, our errors are, are normal, not normal, but, but, but we are modeling the error structure using an appropriate function and that's why when we test for normality, now they are like transformed. We did that, we did that transformation, but we did that like using the link function. And it's totally okay that we did that. And that's exactly what we are inspecting. Uh, okay, I will show you like maybe now, or let me see what, I, okay. Okay, what we are doing here, I will show you how this function works, because you cannot see everything here. But expand grid will create like all the possible combinations between different variables. And here I want to create all the possible combinations between mass values. And I'm creating here a sequence from zero, no, from the minimum of mass that I have in my data to the maximum with 200 points, so I, I, I'm creating a huge vector of 200. And I want to, for, and I'm doing that for both species, but expand grid functions, function will create all the possible combinations between my first vector and my second vector. So all the possible combinations between all the 200 values that I have for my species, uh, for the two species that we have. So we will end up with a data frame with 400 rows with all the mass possible values that we want to find and all the possible species in our data set. And we will fill that with the predictor, uh, uh, the fitted value from our model. And we do that by using the predict function. And we, the arguments that we need to provide to the predict function is the, our model. This data frame, this new data frame that we created. And here, because I want to plot that in the same scale as my response variable, I need to tell the predictive function that I want the data back 
in the scale of my response variable, and we do that by using this algorithm, this uh, argument type response. Okay. Otherwise, I would have like a value that it wouldn't match to my data. But if I do the exponential of that value, I will go back to my uh, uh, response scale. But the function is already doing that for us. So, and I'm adding this to. I'm adding this as a column of my new data object. And I want to plot that. And I will plot that by using like ggplot. And I'm, I'm using like geom point to plot the points. And the geom line uh, function to create a line with those predicted values that I just calculated. OK? So this is the uh, response that we have. So warbler here. Actually, it's the opposite because, like Cuckoo, like they don't need to beg that much to get what they want. Basically, that's what is happening. So they are similar, but like smaller warblers need to beg more than like a, war a Cuckoo with the same mass. That's what the interaction effect is showing us. Okay. So this is how we will do that. Uh, I will show you the, how the predict function is working uh, when we go to the computer. Uh, here is what he asked uh, before. So we have different uh, possibilities of like nature of the data that we are doing with. And like depending on the nature of the data, we, we could use a particular distribution. And for every distribution, we have what we call like the default, or like in statistics, this is the canonical link function. So for a Gaussian, is identity. For Poisson, is the log. Uh, proportions is log it, but you can assume like a different one. There are other possibilities for some of them, but there are restricted uh, possibilities. OK, you can find that. Uh, this is from a uh, Fox, Gordon Fox book. The one, one, it's on the list from yesterday. Uh, but you can find that like in like different books. In, uh, ben Boker has a chapter in his book of probability distributions. And he will tell you the same information. But uh, this is where we start. And because. Uh, our model structure is a bit more complicated. We are not uh, estimating parameters uh, using the least squares method anymore when you, we are using GLM. Uh, and there are other methods. I'm not going uh, to enter into those, how those methods work. But basically, there's maximum likelihood, different algorithms, algorithms that uh, do parameter estimation using maximum likelihood. There's quasi-likelihood. Uh, this is useful for zero inflated distributions uh, and Bayesian approaches. Okay, there are different ways of estimating parameters. I'm not going through this because we do not have time. But again, Ben Boker's book has a really good explanation of how ma maximum and likelihood and quasi-likelihood works and a good starting point to understanding like parameter estimation in general. So I will talk about, uh, I'll bring you one example of a GLMM. And the idea here is that like we can or, or cannot, uh, we, we can use a, a generalized linear model for modeling variables that uh, do not follow a normal distribution. In that case, it would be a generalized linear model. But we can also have, as in the example here, like a linear model with a normal error distribution. But because of the nature of the data, uh, errors are not independent. And observations are not independent. So the errors, therefore, are not independent as well. And when we violate the independence of residual assumption, we need to use a model like this. And this is true like when we have specific uh, designs, like experimental or sampling designs with blocks, like we talked about it. And I will show an example with that. Or like individual level effects, like repeated species of the same individual through time or something like that. 
or when we have like zero inflated models, sometimes an error structure can be used to deal with that. Like instead of using like we could model abundance of a species, for, for, for example, with a Poisson distribution. But usually we have too many zeros when we are dealing with abundance. And we could use like a zero inflated distribution or we could model the variance of the error with uh, a proper structure of our, uh, use the random effect to deal with zero inflated mo models. There are ways of doing that. Uh, ben Boker, obviously, he teaches us how to do that. Uh, so let's use this example again. This is from the Veleta uh, workshop. Um, and we have a scenario like a researcher is uh, studying uh, population and anthrax population growth. And he wants to, the person here wants to find out um, which media is the best to grow an anthrax population. So they had uh, four different medias, but uh, funding was limited and they didn't have like a big like room to do the experiment. So and, and randomly assign like where uh, they would put uh, the different medias. So they had to do like in different rooms. And what they did, we note, notice here like media two here is in one position here, in, in another one here, in another, another one here. So this was randomly assigned. So we are not like biased for the position of where the media is. This is something that we should always do when we can. Uh, and here, the case is that every media is not independent from another because they are clustered in one block. So this is a typical block design. We have blocks, repeated blocks, and uh, this media is not independent from this one, okay? And we cannot treat them as independent, so we cannot use a, a regular linear model for that. We need a random effect for that. So, but again, we are doing this first in the wrong way. So we are reading the data. I'm just converting here media and cabinet uh, are numeric, numerical variables, but they are actually categorical. So I'm converting this into a factor and I'm building a linear model of growth with respect to media. And I'm inspecting these values. So I, I will have like different uh, estimates for the four different medias here. Uh, but uh, the cabinet, we already know that the cabinet, uh, like where the, like the block structure, uh, has an effect. So we need to take that into account. So let's now add cabinet to our linear model. And we, will, we, we have here now like one estimation for each media in each cab, uh, cabinet. We have here like um, a lot of parameters and like those are not independent. So we cannot actually do this. So this is not like the right way of taking cabinet into account because this is not something that we are like measuring, controlling it. So we can do that. We can use that as a random effect. And that's the, basically the difference between a fixed effect and a random effect. This is like, in this example, it's, uh, it's easy to distinguish, distinguish between them, but in real life, sometimes those things are not like super binary and easy to define. Uh, but in this case, like the media, we, cho we choose the media to be tested. This is the goal of the experiment. Each media has a specific identity, and we want to estimate the differences in bacterial growth between the different medias, right? Uh, the cabinet, we don't care about the identity of the cabinet, so that's why we are not adding cabinet as a fixed effect. Each cabinet is sampled from a population of possible cabinets. Uh, this is like something that already exists, it's not like given by the data. And we just want to predict 
and absorb the variance in the bacterial control rate explain it by the cabinet because the bacterial control uh, growth can vary from one cabinet to another that is and we want to measure that that's it we want to measure that variance but not include that in the uh, estimate of our coefficients and the way we do that like we here have like Again, media is a categorical variable, so we have like different uh, expected uh, values for our, our x, like uh, here we have three because the first one is contained here in the intercept, so beta zero, beta one, x one, beta two, x, x two, beta three, x three, plus a random structure here uh, that is basically modeling the variance of the growth uh, explain it by the cabinet effect. This is what this term is doing and we still have our error. So the way we, we, we will build the model, now we are, we are using the uh, LME4 package and again it's the same structure, our response variable growth with respect to media and the way we specify our random effect is using like parentheses here and here we are assuming that uh, there's a variance uh, the variance in the estimate of our intercept is due to the cabinet effect uh, and we have here, like I'm doing a summary of this model, it will show us the formula, it will, it will give us the scaled residual, so this should be normal because they already scaled, so this should be normal. Oh, this is not like, this is just a linear model, but okay, but for a G GLM, this would be true. Uh, and we have the estimates of uh, the random effects and the fixed effects here. So the fixed effects should be like more or less similar to what we had before with a linear model, but we are correcting like the effect of the cabinet. We are quantifying the variance in the uh, intercept estimate due to the effect of the cabinet. Um, Visualizing a GLMM, uh, the effect of uh, a random effect is uh, trickier than for uh, linear models or generalized linear models. There are tons of packages to help visualizing uh, those effects. Uh, one package that is really good to like extract predictors, uh, fitted values, and um, plotting them is the Mare Tools package. And here, I'm, the way that we do that for a mixed model is that we, we estimate the confidence of interval of our uh, parameter estimation, taking into account the random effects. So this is what this FECM function is doing. It is simulating the confidence, confidence in interval based on the random effects of our model. And we are, this is a bootstrap process, so we have to tell how many simulations we will be doing here. Uh, and it's a thousand, just to not take us too many time. Uh, depending on the model structure that we have, like this can be like super time consuming, but this is a simple model with fewer observations. And the same package uh, has a way of visualizing this so what we are seeing here, like what we want to check in this graphic is like the effect size of uh, the medias, the different medias. And here we have a plot with the dots here are the mean effect estimate, like of, from our fixed effect, the media. And the error bars here were built using uh, based on the estimation of the variance of the media effect taking into account the cabinet effect and what we want here like this is uh, this has a po everything like above zero is a positive effect 
below zero negative effect. If any of these segments touches this red line here, we do not have a significant uh, uh, effect uh, from a particular variable. So in this case, we learned that uh, media two has a positive effect, the other ones has, have ne negative effects. And we did that taking into account, we are not like uh, underlooking the cabinet effect. We are taking that into account, but we are not interested in that. We are using that just to model uh, the variance in our estimate. So, oh, we have time. Okay, uh, I, I uh, put, let me show you how things are. Because I think that first, too many tabs here. Uh, here, uh, there's the tutorial for model selection. I added here like the link for the scripts from this uh, slide, so it's like easy for you to easier for you to follow. Um, I want to show you the predict uh, function. But uh, I will do that. I will do that first. Okay, let's do that. So I downloaded my computer is a mess, but I downloaded here a script called eight. I just click it on like this. Find here the script. I'll organize that uh, better. I'll put that in my repository here. Uh, I'm renaming that to like 6 uh, GLM, GLM um, and I will open my project and okay so this is uh, basically the script from uh, the, oh, I'm following the wrong script. <laughs> okay, I have to open the correct script number six. Okay, oh, I have to install the packages so I can do that. I hope it doesn't take too long. There's an L missing here. Oh. oh, something happened here. That, that there's a D missing. Yeah, I think that it's completely broken. Yeah, I, I, I automatically like saved the script, but something happened. Okay, so let's go. I'll fix that and let's go to the tutorial first. Um, in order to run the tutorial, we will need to uh, download the Cuckoo data. This is what we will be using. So I'll click here to download and I'll follow the tutorial here. So there are uh, a particular uh, context where model selection could be a good approach. You can learn more about that on Burnham Burnham and Anderson book about model selection and model inference. Um, usually, like we have like an, an hypothesis and we confront that with a no hypothesis. That's what is what we are doing when we like we're using the F test in, in a GLM, for instance. But there's like limitation on that. And besides that, the idea, one of the ideas behind model selection is that we uh, can actually model the information contained in the data and make a decision based on the data and not on a statistical, uh, on, uh, uh, frequentist statistical test. And we can also create uh, models to, to represent multiple hypotheses and we can test, confront mo multiple hypotheses at, at the same time, what we cannot do like in a frequentist approach. 
Um, and the idea here is the search for a model that best like represents or translates our data. And we want to find like which model loses at the least amount of information in relation to data. This is stated like this because it's uh, model selection, it's based on maximum likelihood and max maximum likelihood is based on uh, information theory. Uh, that's why information is based here, but I'll be not talking about information theory. Um, so, uh, I will always stick to the idea that when we are doing model selection, um, statistical modeling, we are connecting theory with, with data and that we will always start with a good research question, okay? It's not something that I'm, I'm saying, like Burnham and Anderson in their book, this is actually from the book, and I really like that, uh, it's repeated. We recommend emphasis, more emphasis on thinking. So yeah, statistics is great, it's a great, great tool. This works really for you, Joan. <laughs> uh, but we need to have a clear research question. We need to know what we want to do, and that way we can build like good models and, and actually extract something from the data. Because the thing about model selection is that when you have like, you can con confront mo multiple hypotheses, but you are building like uh, bad models and in the end you se select like the least worst model, it can happen. So that's why we always have to think about uh, what we want and emphasis on thinking more on the statistics. Statistics is only a tool what we do as a, as a researcher is much more than that. And like some guiding questions like, can we achieve like the ob objectives that we want with our model approach? Uh, a really, really important question is if our sample or experimental design was, uh, was carefully defined it and we need to understand that, that structure so we can model that if we need like a mixed model or something like that. Uh, usually, like, usually, like most of the time, we should define the models before uh, sitting in our computer doing analysis, and really think about what is the justification behind the models. The basis of model selection is uh, a criteria, criteria, different criteria based on information. So, uh, the idea here is that we are trying to find like the model that is closest to the data, the data being the truth, and which model is uh, closest to that information that is derived from information theory and the combination of that with maximum likelihood. And for instance, one way of doing inference in model selection is using the Akaic information criterion, which is basically the maximum likelihood function plus two times k is k is the number of parameters are in our model. And the idea here is that we want the data that is closest, uh, the model that is closer to, closer, the closest to our data with the least parameters, okay? Sometimes we'll select a model with uh, a lot of parameters, like the full model, the model of the most parameters, but that's because it's closest to our data and not because it just have a lot of parameters and, and it fits better because uh, uh, of having um, more parameters. So we, we, when we are doing inference based on AIC, we are searching for the model with the lowest AIC value and we will, we will rescale AC values uh, starting from the smallest to the highest value. And uh, a cut here is that models with uh, delta AIC less than two are re equally plausible, so we cannot like uh, reject an, an hypothesis that um, has AIC less than two. And we are using like the, an example with the cuckoo data because the other Juan asked <laughs> how do we know like if we have like the, an interactive effect. So that's 
what I wanted to test in the example. We have here three different hypotheses. First of all, like, doesn't matter, like, there's no difference between species, like, the response will be equal. Uh, mass will affect equally both species, so we wouldn't have a difference. Uh, so, I could expect the species having a similar response, but one species having to beg more, so with uh, different intercept, but not different slopes. Or our third hypothesis, uh, where uh, the mass, uh, the effect on mass is different you know, on the different species. And we can translate those hypotheses into models. So I have here three different hypotheses and a hypothesis where uh, bagging is affected by mass only. Bag is affected by mass and species, but we are assuming similar responses. Bag is affect, affected by mass and species, with species responding differently to the mass effect. And I'm adding, also adding here, a null model, like imagine that we are completely wrong and mass or species has nothing to do with bagging. So, a way of building a null model is just like add, putting a zero here. And we fit like all those models. Let's do that. Let's, I'll just copy this. I forgot to add the copy button here. I'm sorry for that, but this should work. So, model selection. I don't have to library. Oh, I, I'll have to library. I don't know if I added that also. So a uh, package that we are using just because we have like a good uh, AIC tab function is BBMLE. Oh, I don't have it. So I'll install that first. I will run like create models to represent each hypothesis. I will grab from this script. Okay, so we are first uh, building one model for each hypothesis. Obviously, I have to read my data. I didn't do that yet. So I downloaded my data. Cuckoo here, and I need to put that on my documents. Teaching this branch data raw. So I'm I'm adding my cuckoo data here. I will read the data. So read CSV data raw uh, cuckoo. Okay. We have our cuckoo data here. the mass of each individual, how, how many they had to bag, and this species here. Uh, how much they had to. Uh, and we will create uh, one model for each species. So our first hypothesis is the effect of mass only, mass and species. Uh, effect of mass uh, being different uh, with the different species and our no hypothesis. Um, let me see what I put in there. Okay. I'll create uh, a summary of, for instance, our full model. 
we will have the estimates of the parameters as we saw that and we have here like one of the informations that we have here is the AIC. So this means nothing like doesn't matter if it's big if it's it doesn't matter like this value here. Um, it's how close to your data is but the scale matters like among the different models. So here I have a 784 AIC. Let's check our hypothesis too. How is that working? It's 794. I know that this is higher, but and probably the hypothesis of the interaction is like the best explanation for our data. But we can extract the AIC using AIC and the model. And we could compare like all of them, AIC of H1. Let's see our H0. It's really, really far further <laughs> from, uh, from the others. Uh, but there's a function from the BBMLE package uh, called ACTAB which tabulates uh, AIC for different models. And what we do here is that we add our models, so AIC, H0, H1, H2, H3. I have to load my package, of course. Then, this will give us already the delta AIC, which is the measure that we should check here. H3, our hypothesis that uh, species respond differently to the mass effect, uh, seems to be uh, the best explanation for our data. And the DF here is, is the degrees of freedom. So this is a model with four parameters and still the best explanation for our data. It's being penalized for having four parameters and still is a good model. Uh, notice that like when we add like H2 is the additive effect. It, we have like three parameters but it's, it's not as good as like H1. H1 is just the effect of mass. So mass is, seems to be like the most important effect here. Uh, but we do have uh, uh, different effects depending on the species. Uh, uh, if we had like H5 and it was 1.5 delta AIC, uh, we wouldn't be able to say, yeah, yes. that, that's the question. Yes, I mean, imagine that H1 uh, delta AIC is 1.5. We have, ha we would have to take into account that okay, species matter, but like the effect, the effect of mass is so big that we cannot like exclude the option of like having like a simpler explanation for our data. It's tricky when we have like uh, a tie here, but people do publish papers with a tie <laughs> and it's not like something that we, we need to like uh, like reject everything that we did but we do have to build an explanation for that like a reasonable biological explanation explanation uh, of how we can do that uh, there's there are some tools there's an argument well there's an argument here for base I will set base equals true because I like to see like the actual va value of AAC even though this does not mean like that much, but usually we add that information as well. And there's another parameter called weights. And I'll add here weights as true, because this is super useful when we have a tie. So what it, it is showing us is that this all sums to one. So which is the model that is uh, exp explaining the most of our data? This is, due, this is based on the delta AAC. This is calculated based on that. So if we have a tie, sometimes like we can choose like which explanation we will like choose and discuss like in the discussion part of 
of uh, our paper using like, oh, I'm choosing because of the weight or we can discuss like both possibilities, but the weight is a really good tool to understand how uh, well the best model is doing compared to the others. This is like by far the best one. Uh, eight, like uh, two, like seems like, oh, two is like, maybe we can have a tie and have like only zero and one, but in the AIC scale, two is a lot, okay? So eight here is already a lot because it, it is just like super different from the like proportion of how much it, it is explaining the data. So that's why we use two because in the scale of the delta AIC, two is already a lot. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you with a bit more time is uh, how the predict function works. So I'm creating here, I'm using this function expand grid just to create. I will show you what we are doing here. Mass is a sequence from uh, the minimum to the maximum value of uh, our data. Let me grab this. So, what's happening? Something is going wild in my environment. But what we have here is a vector from the minimum to the maximum. I can check the tail. I don't think that I showed you that, but head shows the first six elements, tail the last six. We can control that by adding, like I want the first 10. Uh, this is a parameter in, in, in or, the, or the last 10 in this case. But this goes from 4.98 to 62. And the length of this object here is 200. And I want to uh, make all the possible combinations of this mass vector with the species vector. And species here is basically the unique values that we have for the species. When we do that, our dimension of new data is 400 because we we'll have all the 200 combinations of the mass values for both species. We could do that by hand, but expand grid is super useful. And new data. So what we have here is mass and species. We want to add a new column with the predictor, predicted value from our model. Uh, I don't have a Cuckoo GLM. Here is the H3 model. So I'm using the function predict and I want to fill every line of my new data table with the predicted variable and I want that to be in the scale of my response variable and that's why we are using type response here. So when we check that, let's see a summary of new data. Our bag column, it goes from 4 to 243. If we do that, without the response, the response here, I will already apply summary to this here. This is not in the scale of our variable. To have that, we should have the explanation of it. And then if we do the summary, because it's a Poisson regression with log link to get back to our, uh, the scale of our response variable, we use the inverse of the link function, which is the exponential, and that's how we go back. But we do not have to like use the inverse of the function if we can use uh, this argument here, type response. It will already do that for us. It know, the function knows that this is like if, if we check the class of the H3, it is a GLM, which is basically an LM also. So it has the properties of both classes and the predict function can understand the class and then calculate uh, well the predict. Um, you can 
check, like we have a predict function in base, it will be predict.lm, predict glm is a function uh, in the stats package, yeah, that will deal with, that will apply the predict a method that predict operation in the predict function to an object of class uh, GLM. Uh, and here it will explain us uh, how to use the type. We have different options, the link, the default, the response or terms. We can choose to calculate the standard errors from the predictions as well. Uh, for LM and GLM, predict function works really well. For GLM, we need to use other tools to estimate the intervals. That's why I show, showed you the uh, MER tools package, because when we, we have uh, a random effect, we are modeling the variance in the uh, estimates, the parameter, parameter estimates that we are doing, and we need to take that into account so we when we are calculating the confidence interval. So the calculation is a bit different. That's why we are not, we, we will not use the predict function in those cases. And here is how we can plot that. So data here is Coco. Okay, so something crazy happened with this code. So our plot here, oh my God. Do I have a library? ggplot2, do I have this, Map, mapping data cuckoo, what is happening, invalid, I'll create here a script six tutorial dot r. Uh, I will restart my R section because there are things were happening here that I do not understand. Uh, let's see if this works better this way. So this is our data, this is our models, I'm recreating everything again. Okay, now it's working. So this line here is being built using uh, the same uh, aesthetics here, mass and bag. But here, new data, we are just specifying different data from which to choose the variables. And that's why we have this line here. It's like every predicted value from uh, our uh, new data object. So this is basically what I wanted to show you today. Uh, there, like, there's much more obviously, and when we escalate to mixed models, there are tons of different um, error structures that we can think of. And for instance, when we have like, observations in particular like locations like with coordinates uh, we should like use the location as a random effect but there's like when we have coordinate data there's a specific uh, way of doing that like statistically so there are specific models to build when we have an error structure that uh, is due to like specific locations the same for phylogenies for instance uh, there are like mixed models to, where we model the error structure uh, based on a phylogeny if we want to like test uh, something in that context, in an evolutionary context. Um, so there's like a huge word for starting. I really recommend there are like the references that I put in Here are really, really great tools. So the workshop uh, from Valeta and McKinley, this is where I took, where I took the examples from. Uh, this Dharma package, we talked yesterday more about inspecting. 
uh, model inspection for linear models. For mixed models, this is a bit more tricky. We still have to inspect the model, and there are specific tools to do that. In our, for instance, there's the Dharma package uh, for functions to inspect uh, mixed models. Uh, Mer tools package also to deal with like predict. Uh, um, effects from uh, mixed models and calculate confidence intervals. Uh, this uh, Ben Boker has uh, a really good, like he has the book and he also has have this mixed model guide because he's the person in charge of like different R packages doing that and he replies to all the questions in the forums and everything. So there's a really, really good uh, FAQ, the Frequent Asked Questions about GLMM. Basically, every question that you could think of is already there because someone already asked it, Ben Boker that, so read that before asking him anything. Uh, if it's not there, yes, you can ask him. Um, so, and the package LME4 is from Douglas Bates. Uh, is, it is the one that we use it. Uh, for model selection, I highly recommend Anderson and Burhan book. And for mixed models, there's this Alan Zur book with tons of examples of mixed models and also uh, generalized adjective models. Uh, they're like, really a lot of options here and can guide you through our like common research questions in ecology. So that's everything for today. Git commit, yes. I'll do that. You can also do that with our tutorial. I will fix the code from the slides, okay, and git commit, but first we have a question, can you pass the mic to? Can I do a GLM for a, a model that it's a simulation so you doesn't have any hypothesis? Yes. Uh, we can do that. I'm really glad you, glad you asked that because usually people just do that without thinking of can I do this? But I'm, I'm, I'm repeating about having our research questions guiding our statistical analysis all the time. Uh, when you meet Glauco, you see that he's like much worse than me. But um, Sometimes we do not know anything about a particular process and we want to investigate. And like we can also use like model selection for that. I think that in Bernan and Bernhan and Anderson, they also mention it about uh, variant, uh, variable selection because sometimes we want, we want just to, we just want to explore things. But if we do, we do have that scenario, we can build different models and, and that, like there are tools for like, imagine that you have tons of variables and you, have, you, you need to understand like all the effects, additive and interactive exactly. effects of them. <laughs> there are tools for like binding all the possible combinations uh, for that. But even if you're doing that, I would first think of like, does it make sense to make all the possible combinations or do I have a good uh, biological reason for only like limit limiting a few possible combinations? It's okay if you need to do all of them, but you have to be sure that, that you are not like just randomly walking through all the possibili possibilities that you have. But you can use like even model selection for variable selection purposes. That is something that people do, and there are ways of doing that like uh, more properly and than like just building all the because sometimes you do that and then you have like different ties, like you have like five different best models, and what you, what do you do with that result? Uh, that's why we should always like 
limited, limit a bit the scope if we can, but if not, like do variable selection with like thousand variables and see what happens. It's not wrong, but I'm really get, glad you asked it. Okay. Okay. So that's it. Tomorrow we'll have our last class together. Aww. Uh, Andrea will come, but she's, uh, I like her better, so I hope you like her better as well. Um, but we'll, I will show you tomorrow uh, a few possibilities of implementing two species dynamics in R. And I'll try to, I'm really in doubt about what package I, from the ones you listed, I will bring tomorrow. Probably, I'm, I'll probably pick something related to dates and time series because I haven't talked about it and that is something really like useful in modeling. Um, usually we have like time uh, series, so that's probably, that will probably be my choice. But it will be more like a hands-on class to show possibilities with things related to what Roberto is teaching and other possibilities that you will probably see. But next uh, module, so this is the first, this will be like the first part of our biologic, bi biology and ecology toolkit. But um, Andrea will give you like much more like uh, uh, examples of uh, ecological things to do. I saw that some of you were talking about uh, taxonomic packages, uh, vegan vegetation analysis. This is like my favorite package ever because the documentation is really good. But Andrea will cover that. So a few things that you listed, Andrea will already cover, like predictive modeling and community analysis in general. So I'll try to bring um, time series. That's my goal for tomorrow. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow you, you, tomorrow you, you are available? Yes, I'll be available tomorrow from four to five. Okay. And we, th this will be like my last uh, time slot for you, but I will be on Slack or anything. So if you want to like talk uh, about things, we can like uh, do that uh, virtually if, if, if you need, okay? So that's it. So thank you. See you tomorrow.